uh, we are recording the presenter, myself and uh, Valerie, who I'm going to pass it over to in a second. Uh, there will be time for questions. If you want to come on video and ask the question, it won't actually capture your video. So uh, if you're worried about that, you're welcome to, to pop on uh, when you want to ask your question. It will, of course, capture your audio. However, there'll be opportunities for you to put questions in the chat. So if you'd rather be completely anonymous and not captured by the recording, you certainly can. Recording also means that if you have to pop out or you miss anything, it will be available on Future Energy Systems YouTube and you can see past and future talks there as well. Uh, so I jumped right into things, but hello everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Cassidy. I'm with the Edmonton Public Library and I am uh, really excited for tonight's talk. I am your tech support, so I will be in the background hanging out, keeping an eye on the chat if there's any issues. If you get disconnected, you also have my email and work cell from the reminder email I sent a couple hours ago. Get a hold of me. I will do my best to get you back in so you can enjoy the rest of the evening. I'll also be keeping an eye on the chat with Valerie in case there's any questions. So we will pause for them, but if you want to throw them in there when you think of them, that's A-OK -okay as well. Uh, with that, I will pass it on over to Valerie Miller from Future Energy Systems. Thank you so much, Cassidy, and welcome everyone. We're so happy to have you join us tonight for the last energy talk of 2021. Uh, we want to begin our talk by respectfully acknowledging that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. We are truly grateful to have the opportunity to work, study, and live on this land. To start us off, who is Future Energy Systems? We were launched in 2016 with $75 million from the Government of Canada's Canada First Research Excellence Fund to help Canada transition to a low net carbon energy economy. We focus on multidisciplinary research that develops the energy technologies of the near future, integrates them into today's infrastructure, and examines possible consequences for our society, economy, and environment. We also contribute to the development of solutions for the challenges presented by current energy systems. We have over 100 research projects, over 140 researchers, and over 700 graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and other highly qualified personnel, one of which you will meet tonight. So I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Arane Brown, who is originally from Jamaica. He became fascinated with chemistry because of all the vibrant colors encountered in his high school chemistry labs. He completed a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at the University of West Indies and taught high school chemistry and biology for three years and then came to Canada for graduate school. He completed a PhD in chemistry with a focus on the, catal the catalyst relevant to crude oil upgrading and is currently a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Chemistry and the Department of Chemical and Materials Engineering at the University of Alberta. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. We are thrilled to have you and so excited for your talk. Uh, just for everyone, as Cassie said, you can pop your questions in the chat. We're going to be stopping about halfway through and then again at the end. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Arain, and thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie. And welcome, everyone. I trust uh, everyone can see my screen here. I hope so. We can see your slides. We're on slide number two. Oh, all right. Let's go back to number one. Perfect. All right. Yeah. So uh, um, again, I just like to thank the uh, Future Energy System Science Outreach Team and the Edmonton Public Library for hosting this talk. Uh, you know, um, I think about Edmonton, living in Edmonton. There are two things I love about Edmonton, and not in any particular order, but it's the River Valley and the Edmonton Public Library. I don't know which one I love more, but I do love both things. So I really am um, very, very 
uh, happy to be a part of this um, outreach that's hosted by Edmonton Public Library. Uh, all right, I'd just like to get started now. This evening, I'd like to talk about the hydrogen challenge, looking at greener strategies for processing biomass and uh, crude oil. And um, let's go here. Right, here we go. So we know that you know addressing climate change is definitely the defining challenge of our time. And I just did this very simple activity. I just went on Google and searched climate change um, a couple of days ago. And there's no shortage of headlines. Obviously, the BC floods um, pop to the top because you know they're topical and very recent. Um, but there are also, you know, some uh, bit more controversial. I'll go to a little point, right? There are, you know, one or two very controversial topics that I won't say much about. But the, the fact of the matter is that uh, climate change is real and it is very, very um, present in our you know in our time and um it's affecting us in ways that we we are not even thinking about so even you know say for example athletes um you know are affected significantly by you know changes in climate and while there's an ongoing um uh, effort to address you know um changes in climate the fact of the matter is that as highlighted by um the intergovernmental panel on climate change that um, what's being done currently is simply not enough in order to restrain global warming to the 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius target. So they're expecting that we must have much deeper reductions in the amount of carbon dioxide we emit if we're going to have any chance of hitting this um, uh, 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius warming target. So there's lots of work to be done. And this is just um, from the report uh, this year. So the question is, well, how do we do this? Well, first of all, we need to understand, I mean, what's contributing to global warming? And we know, I mean, the number one um, culprit in all of this is carbon dioxide. Um, you know, the youngest child knows that carbon dioxide is not our friend as far as climate change is concerned. And this is put up by environmental, environment Canada, environment and climate change Canada, it's called now. Just looking at the different contributors to carbon dioxide, um, you know, in, in um, our domestic situation, and you find is that energy, whether it is stationary energy, so generating electricity, or, or heat, or and transportation, account for over seventy percent of the carbon dioxide emissions in um, in Canada. And so, if we are going to bring down um, CO two emissions then it's obvious that we have to address CO2 emissions from energy sources. And this evening, I'm going to focus more on um, uh, uh, transportation-related carbon dioxide emissions. Um, they make up about a third of our total, but it's a very, very important um, third. And of course, you know, every, every if we can um, reduce this, this, um, this sector, emissions in this sector, um, we definitely are going to be making a significant dent in the overall um, mass of carbon that's going to be happening. So, as I said, we're going to look at um, emissions from, um, you know, the, the transportation industry. Um, when you think about it, you know, uh, in order to, you know, address these emissions, we want to know, you know, where does the fuel come from, and and where, you know, where does the carbon dioxide go, that sort of thing. So. In the transportation industry, currently, we get our fuel from one of two places. We either get it from fossil fuels, um, which is the, the traditional and predominant source. Um, for us here in Alberta, we know that um, the oil sands are a major source of um, transportation fuels. But we also get a significant amount of our fuel from biomass. Now, the vast majority of the fuel from biomass now comes via fermentation. And so, you know, you think about um, alcohol, ethanol being added to fuel, you know, 10%, 20%, depending on where you are. So uh, petrol, um, petroleum sources and um, biomass, those are the major sources of um, our fuel. But, you know, you can't just take oil sands and put it in your tank, and you can't just take grass and put it in your tank. So there has to be some processing. And the processing that takes place 
generally uh, requires high temperatures um, for petroleum and it requires quite a bit of hydrogen gas as an input in the refining process, right? So, and, and the thing about that is that um, in addition to the carbon dioxide that's released when we burn petrol, there's quite a bit of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that's released in just processing the raw material into the finished products that we put into our vehicles. And it's the same for uh, biomass that, um, well, you know, apart, apart from fermentation, you know, there's a process we're going to look at now where we want to take the lignin and biomass and sort of break it apart um, to get liquid fuels and chemicals out of that. But again, the challenge is that the process generally requires high temperatures and it requires quite a bit of hydrogen as an input. And both of those things add cost and they add greenhouse gases to the process. So, uh, you know, I, our, our, our standpoint in terms of research is looking at the process that leads to these fields and trying to see if we can reduce the greenhouse gas intensity of these processes. And, um, you know, we want to do that by A, reducing hydrogen consumption and B, uh, doing these on the milder conditions. So of course that, you know, we have fewer greenhouse gases. Um, involved in the processing. We're not addressing the combustion side of things. That's for another day, but we're looking today at um, processing. But um, somebody might ask the question, well, hydrogen and greenhouse gases, there seems to be a disconnect there because, you know, in the idealized hydrogen economy, you know, we could just burn hydrogen for fuel because if you take hydrogen and, you know, mix it with oxygen, you give it a spark, that's combustion. Instead of, you know, say petrol, where you get carbon dioxide and water, in this case, if you burn hydrogen, you get water and nothing else. And that seems very idealized to me. That seems like the best fuel to, to use where water is the only byproduct. And not only that, but if we just look at energy density in terms of how much energy you get out of a kilogram of, um, of different fuels, what we see is that hydrogen is twice more than twice as energy dense as the next um, fuel, which is natural gas. So of all the, you know, the fuels that we have you know, for combustion, nuclear fuels are separate. But in terms of combustion fuels, hydrogen is the most energy dense. So you get the most energy per kilogram out of hydrogen. And the only byproduct is water. So it does seem like an idealized fuel um, it's the only zero emission combustion fuel in that the only emission is, um, is water. So the question is, why haven't we transitioned to this hydrogen only economy? And um, the challenge is that hydrogen has what uh, we you know, I like to call a not so um, dirty, well, a dirty but not so little secret. And here's the challenge with um, the hydrogen economy is that most of the hydrogen we get currently comes from two processes um, that are usually in, you know, uh, combined, right? So the first process is where we take uh, methane from natural gas, we mix it with water and we heat it up to as high as 900 degrees over a catalyst and we get hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And that reaction is called steam um, reforming. And then in order to get a bit more hydrogen, what we do is that we take the carbon monoxide and mix it with some more steam, this time at a lower temperature, and we get carbon dioxide as a side product and the hydrogen. Now the challenge with this process is that while we get four units of hydrogen for every unit of carbon dioxide, the differences in weight mean that for every eight grams of hydrogen that we get out of this process, we're producing 44 grams of carbon dioxide, right? Well, that's not only, um, that's not the only source of carbon dioxide, because if you take into account the temperatures that we need to operate at 900 degrees, 450 degrees in some cases, the only way to get to those temperatures is that we have to burn natural gas usually in order to supply the heat that's necessary to drive the reaction. And of course, if you're burning natural gas, you're producing carbon dioxide. So what you find is that overall, for every uh, one kilogram of 
hydrogen that's produced. And you know, I call it gray hydrogen here. You'll see why in a bit. But for every one kilogram of hydrogen that's produced, we produce up to 11 kilograms of carbon dioxide, right? So I think you can begin to see what's the challenge with the hydrogen economy, both in terms of using it as a fuel and using it as a, as a reagent in process condition, right? And just for comparison, uh, if you take gasoline, if you were to burn about a, a kilogram of gasoline, that's about 1.3 liters, you would get um, only 3.3 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So producing hydrogen is way more uh, greenhouse gas intensive than simply burning uh, you know, um, gasoline. So that's a challenge. I mean, it's not all uh, bad um, that we can significantly reduce the emissions that are associated with hydrogen production by implementing something that's called a carbon capture and storage regime. It's essentially that the carbon dioxide that's produced during hydrogen uh, manufacture is sequestered, is captured and piped somewhere and stored. And actually, this is something that's a reality. So one example is Shell's um, refinery in Scotford, just uh, northeast of Edmonton. Um, at their facility when in manufacturing hydrogen, they capture the carbon dioxide and then they pipe that carbon dioxide from just north of Fort Saskatchewan. Um, they pipe it further north to, uh, you know, close by to Radio and Thorhill, and they store that carbon dioxide on the ground. And this has been going since, you know, about 2015. Um, the challenge with this is that it works. It works well, but it does add significant cost to the hydrogen that is um, produced. And this um, gives us a nice comparison of the different ways to produce hydrogen. So gray hydrogen is the standard way. Without any carbon capture, that's the method that I, I, I walked you through before. And with gray hydrogen, what you find that the cost is low, but the emissions are very, very high. As I told you, one kilogram of hydrogen is producing as much as 11 kilograms of carbon dioxide in the process. Uh, now there's also blue hydrogen. And in this case, I mean, the color of gas that, that's produced is not changing. It's just the process, you know. In, in, in blue hydrogen, essentially what, what we have is that we have a traditional hydrogen production that's paired with carbon capture and storage. And in this case, naturally we're going to have lower emissions, but the capital and operating costs for the carbon capture and storage system means that the hydrogen you produce is going to have a significantly higher cost, sometimes as high as two or three hundred percent of the price of gray hydrogen. The most ideal way to produce hydrogen is from electrolysis, especially if you're using renewable electricity. In that case, you have no emissions because the electricity is renewable, it could be solar or wind. The challenge with that, though, is that you know while the research um, is certainly advancing at a rapid pace the cost of the infrastructure and the cost to operate these electrolysis systems is so much that the cost of green hydrogen that is produced without emissions is um, between three and eight US dollars. And of course, if somebody is going to make a, a cost decision um, between gray hydrogen and green hydrogen, unless there's some significant government, um, you know, regulatory pressure, they're obviously going to go with the lower um, priced resource. That's just the difference in the methods of producing hydrogen. Uh, so it's not to say that all hydrogen production is carbon intensive, but the most practical and most widespread hydrogen production now is very um, carbon intensive. Now, I just want to come back to the point we were making earlier, which is this, that to produce our fuels, whether from biomass or petroleum, um, and to produce petrochemicals, we need high temperatures and we need quite a bit of hydrogen. I want now to show you why this hydrogen input is A, so expensive and B, so greenhouse gas intensive. So now I want to sort of um, punch forward to show you um, some strategies that we're trying to adopt to reduce um, the consumption of hydrogen in these processes and at the same time reduce the operating conditions. So we're not, um, you know, using such high temperatures and generating as many greenhouse gases in producing um, these fuels and petrochemicals. And oh, by the way, we're going to start off looking at the biomass side of things and then I'm going to close off 
um, looking at the more traditional petrochemical source of fuels. So uh, biomass, you know, using biomass as a source of energy. Plants are the ideal source of energy. Um, you know, it's a carbon neutral source of energy in, in terms of fact that car plants absorb carbon while they're growing. And then, you know, if you burn them afterwards, they release carbon dioxide and, you know, the cycle continues, you plant new trees and then you keep absorbing and releasing carbon dioxide. So it seems like definitely an ideal process in that it's carbon neutral, right? So the question is, well, why don't we just burn wood instead of all these other fossil fuels? Why don't you just burn wood that way we have the perfect cycle of carbon dioxide um, instead of just continually increasing the amount in the atmosphere? And the challenge is um, that, you know, A, you know, burning wood, as we know, you know produces a lot of other pollutants beside um, greenhouse gases. So there's smoke and so forth. Um, that's, um, you know, not ideal. But I think the more, um, the more pressing issue is just the fact that, you know, if you have, um, you know, a Prius and you want to take a trip, like I love to do out to Jasper, you know, you can't exactly load up your car with wood and use that for fuel. It's not a convenient fuel, right? So, you know, if we're going to use plants as a source of energy, we definitely have to do be more scientific than, you know, um, or forefathers or foreparents were hundreds of years ago, and that we can't just burn wood. But if we look at the components of plants, then maybe we can extract, you know, um, sources, you know, or molecules from, you know, plants that we can use um, as energy sources and as sources of um, chemicals. So let's look at the major molecules in plants and see what is in there that we can extract. Right? So we have proteins and, you know, most of we use that for food. So we definitely don't want to be using proteins, um, you know, as industrial fuel. There's sugars and starches. And again, that's important fuel, food source. Um, but, um, you know, they're also used, you know, through the process of fermentation, not just to make beer and wine, but you can use fermentation of sugars and starches in plants to make ethanol for, um, for, uh, for fuel. And actually, most of the gas we get now includes um, some ethanol that was made by fermentation. Um, there's also cellulose. That's another component in plants. And cellulose is used for paper, amongst other things. But um, you know, with um, advanced fermentation techniques, we can also ferment cellulose to get uh, alcohol for fuel. The challenge with getting, you know, fuels from, you know, things like uh, sugars and starches and even cellulose is that you don't want to be competing. You don't, you don't want your food source and your fuel source to be competing, right? Because you know, take, for example, corn, which is a major source of ethanol. If you're ethanol for fuels, if you're turning corn into fuels, that means it raises the price of corn for people who need it for feeding animals or for eating themselves. So ideally what we want to do is to look for a component in plants that is not the source of food, that is not used for anything else. So it's not competing with other things and then use that as a source of either fuels or chemicals. And lignin really fits that bill to a T um, because now lignin is mostly a byproduct of paper um, manufacture. And in general, it's, it's either waste material that's dumped or it's burned or as a low-grade fuel. So if we can find a way to convert this lignin, you know, into high-value fuels and chemicals, then that certainly gives us a renewable source of um, biofuels and um, biochemicals um, to replace the petro, you know, chemicals that are sourced from um, the petrochemical industry currently. So what is lignin? Right, so lignin is a is a component of a cell wall in plants. So along with cellulose, it is the thing that is found in the cell walls, and it gives rigidity to plants, so that you know wind comes by the tree doesn't topple over. Right, so that's the major role of lignin, and that it's, it plays a structural role in the cells of plants. It's a very complex um, biopolymer. Um, it's the second most abundant biopolymer on Earth. So the only um, polymer that you have more of it is cellulose. So there's a lot of lignin out there in the biosphere. And um, there's a lot of it that's generated as waste from the paper industry and other industries, um, you know, on an annual basis. 
And the thing about lignin is that it is uh, a very good source, not just of fuels if you break it down, but it can also be a very good source of petrochemicals that we currently source from fossil fuels. So if we can find a way to break lignin apart, to break this complex biofouling apart, then we do have a renewable source of both fuels and um, commodity chemicals. <clears throat> so in terms of now looking at you know, the structure chemically, so lignin is made up more or less of these three molecules you have here on the screen. They're called phenylpropanoid molecules. And what happens is that um, uh, plants take these three molecules and in um, you know, uh, the process that we call biosynthesis, they condense these molecules. So they join them together in um, you know, varying manners to give uh, the lignin polymer. And what I've shown here is some of, are some of the key connections in the polymer. And um, this numbering system here um, is just essentially you know, assigning you know, each position and identifier so that when the connections are made, we know what positions are connected where. And why that's important is that this um, uh, uh, linkage that's on the, the bottom left of your screen here, this beta O4 linkage so term because the beta position is connected to the four position of another molecule by an oxygen, hence beta O4. This linkage makes up somewhere between 45 and 60% of all the connections in lignin. So 45 to 60% of all the connections in lignin look like this. So essentially, if we can find a reliable method for breaking apart this connection, then you can see that we're pretty much half the way to breaking lignin down to get the original um, you know, monomers um, that we started with, right? And these monomers now, are, are going to be what, you know, the molecules of interest for both, um, you know, fuels and the petrochemical industry. So the question then is, how do we break down these connections in lignin? And as I, as I mentioned before, the key connection is this beta O4 linkage because it is the, um, the, the, the predominant connection in lignin, but there are other, other connections that are are important and I just keep you know if you keep um, keep your eye on these red connections these are the target connections in lignin that we need to break if we are going to convert this complex biopolymer into these individual chemical molecules that we can use for fuels and chemicals now typically we do this by taking a catalyst so a metal compound you know and we take hydrogen and we heat the lignin with hydrogen and the catalyst, and a reaction takes place that's called hydrogenolysis, which essentially means to use hydrogen to break something, right? And in this case, we're breaking, you're using hydrogen to break the carbon-oxygen bonds. And if you break enough of those carbon-oxygen bonds, then of course, we can go back to our individual molecules that the plants would have started with and that we can now use, right? Now, the challenge with this is, remember, I started off by telling you that hydrogen is not as simple as you see there. It's a small molecule, but it comes with a whole lot of greenhouse gas baggage associated with it. And the thing is that if we're trying to, you know, shift to more renewable sources of energy, then, you know, I mean, a molecule that has, you know, quite a bit of greenhouse gases associated with it is not necessarily as compatible with the biofuels economy that we're trying to um, develop, unless you know it's green hydrogen, but for now it's really expensive to do that and so not very feasible. So the question in the meantime is that can we develop systems that give us the same hydrogenolysis reactions, breaking down lignin, but without using hydrogen, which has been so important for this hydrogenolysis process, right? And the question is, um, you know, can we take hydrogen out of the hydrogenolysis process? Unfortunately, the answer to that is yes. And essentially, to do that, in general, what we um, rely on 
they typically are some molecules that are called alcohol, right? And what we find is that instead of using H2, what we can do is that we can use alcohols as hydrogen donor molecules. If you notice, I've drawn three alcohols here. These are three of the simplest alcohols. And you know that alcohols, they have quite a bit of hydrogen atoms in them. And it turns out that if you pick your catalyst just right, what you can do is that your catalyst can actually go to these alcohols and actually abstract hydrogen atoms from the alcohols as a first step in the process. And then the catalyst now takes that harvested, those harvested hydrogen atoms and uses those hydrogen atoms to break the carbon oxygen bonds to give us these individual molecules that we are targeting. And in the process, when you remove um, the hydrogen from the alcohols, you end up with these um, aldehydes and ketones as side products. And that has its own um, concerns in that sometimes these molecules are not very desirable molecules. Some are better than others. So acetone is probably the best of the lot to have as a side product. But the fact of the matter is that you do have a side product. So there are some advantages to this process in that um, while you, know, you can use alcohols which um, generally might have a lower cost than say hydrogen, um, you know, but the challenge of course is that no, instead of just using H2, a very simple molecule to break this lignin apart, no, you're using a much bigger molecule in terms of the alcohols. And so in chemistry, we say that that process has a poor atom economy. And what does that mean? It's simply that now, instead of using just two atoms in hydrogen to do your reaction, now you're using anywhere from five to 10 or even more atoms in order to do the same reaction. So it's poor atom economy, but still, you know, it's widely used because it's more, um, you know, environmentally friendly in general than say relying on hydrogen um, and the cost can, can be low in some cases. There's another way to do this in terms of hydrogenolysis without hydrogen. And that just involves realizing, if you follow my pointer here, that just like the alcohol, the lignin molecule itself actually has these same hydrogen atoms scattered all over, right? In these hydroxyl residues, we call them, I've highlighted those hydrogen atoms in green. And so, it turns out that, again, if you pick your catalyst and your reaction conditions just right, instead of having an external hydrogen donor molecule, the catalyst can actually go to these residues in lignin. It can pull hydrogen from those residues and then shift that hydrogen over to the carbon oxygen bond here highlighted in red and break that apart, right? So in that case, we're getting hydrogenolysis without any external source of hydrogen. So this would be ideal in terms of atom economy. Why? Because you don't have to put anything in to get the cleavage. The, you know, the lignin supplies the raw material that you need for cleavage. There are no byproducts. But the challenge is that while you know, the research in this, you know, it, it, it is going on in its infancy, but so far, you mean, most of the results that have been reported they rely on metals like palladium and rhenium and ruthenium. And these are very expensive metals to source because these are rare earth metals. And not only are they expensive, but if you think about mining these metals, you know, the impacts can be um, hard on the environment and they're generally fairly toxic. So our thrust is that we want to use this process because this is the ideal process. We use lignin to cleave itself, right? It's the idealized process. But the question is, can we do this by circumventing these not so environmentally friendly metals, both in terms of mining and in terms of toxicity? And um, happily we've found a way to use copper. Now copper is a very common metal. It's in wires all about your house, um, running on your streets. We found a way to use copper, very inexpensive and environmentally benign process to do um, this same chemistry. So essentially what we do is that we take a lignin model compound because we start off our, 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 our study just looking at simple compounds and we build to more complex ones. So we take this, the most simple lignin model compound there is, 
it still has that you know carbon oxygen connection that we need to please. But what we find is that if we take a copper catalyst that's specially prepared and heat that with the lignin molecule compound, that we were very, very delighted to see that the catalyst was able actually to do exactly what we wanted, which is to take hydrogen from these um, you know, residues that are dotted about the molecule and use that hydrogen to affect the cleavage of this carbon or oxygen bond that, um, that we were after. Now, how does this work? Again, it's as I, 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 I was mentioning before, the first thing that happens is that you know you have your copper catalyst. The first thing it does is that it, it goes to this position on the molecule here where you have these uh, hydrogen atoms that are ready to be harvested. The uh, catalyst removes those hydrogen atoms. In the process, the molecule undergoes what we call in chemistry an oxidation. It goes from an alcohol to a ketone. But one of the benefits of this process is that not only did we harvest hydrogen from the lignin uh, model here, but an, uh, uh, an effect, a side effect of this is that this bond here that's highlighted in red becomes much weaker when you change from this group to this group. So now not only have you harvested hydrogen from the molecule, but you have also weakened the bond that you're interested in substantially. So now your catalyst, which has the harvested hydrogen, all it has to do is to slide over to the connection that we're interested in, and it delivers that hydrogen and our molecule breaks apart into the two units that we are interested in. And um, we've been able um, to, to track you know, um, the process of this reaction. What I've done is that I've highlighted each molecule in a different color to correspond with what's here on the graph. And I just want to point out that, you know, we start off, you know, with 100% of our starting uh, material and very, very quickly, you know, the catalyst immediately begins to degrade the molecule. Um, you know, so the concentration of the starting molecule falls off significantly. And at the same time, we have an increase in the concentration of our, um, our individual components of that starting molecule. And then this intermediate here um, is formed, but there's never a whole lot of it. And the reason is that because this bond is so weak from this first oxidation, as soon as it's formed, then it goes on to be broken apart um, very, very easily. And um, this other graph essentially is just to show you that you know, the temperatures we're working at are not very, very high. In general, you know, in process conditions, um, we're thinking of temperatures um, in excess of 200, you know, approaching 300 degrees. We can do this transformation, you know, at anywhere between 100 and 150 um, degrees. I should point out that, you know, the, the copper that we're using, it's not just a bit of copper wire that, you know, we just um, grab from some stray cable and cut it in pieces and throw it in the pot. You know, this catalyst we're using is specially prepared. And so what we do is that we make these copper particles and um, they're supported on a material that's called silica, that's essentially sand, um, but, you know, a special variety of it. And these particles are pretty small, right? So, you know, I mean, in general, the particles that are the, the bright spots in, in these images, these particles are about three nanometers in diameter, three nanometers across. And I've shown you here that a nanometer is about 10 to the minus nine um, meters. So these are incredibly small particles. And in fact, it is the size of these particles that makes them so active for this process um, that we're interested in here. Uh, so we want to look now at, um, <clears throat> you know, how general is this? Because I, I told you that we started off with the simplest compound possible. Um, but lignin is, as I mentioned before, a very complex biomolecule. And this is the linkage. If you look in your top right hand corner here, this is the linkage of concern. You see that there's a lot of attachments to uh, you know, the linkage. It's not just simple as, as the compound I showed you before. So what we did is that we tried to increase the complexity of the molecule by adding all these um, substituents, is what we like to call them, or just these groups. Um, and what we were, were happy to find is that, you know, no matter the groups that we added, you know, we change what we call the substitution pattern, 
even though we're changing, you know, the substitution pattern on the molecule, the conversions still were very, very high in terms of that. This catalyst is fairly general, you know, in terms of um, converting more complex model compounds. But I will point out to you that, you know, if you compare this molecule here in the top right hand corner, you see that just next to the red connection, there's this dangling group that we call a hydroxymethyl group. And you notice it's missing in all of these compounds. And um, that's for an important reason, because when we switch now to molecules that actually have the hydroxymethyl group, so now I've included it here, adjacent to the red bond, the reactivity changes a little bit. And when I say it changes a bit, um, follow me, you know, this is a complex side, but you know, I've tried to keep it simple here. What happens is that you still get, you know, you, the red bond is broken. So you still get the two components that I've highlighted in blue and gold on the screen, right? You do get these two components, but in addition to that, you get quite a bit of these um, other molecules where our starting compound has been transformed, but it's just that the connection that we're interested in has not been broken. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that happens is that remember, the hydrogen that we're using to break the molecule apart is coming from the molecule itself. But there's only so much hydrogen that we can uh, harvest from the molecule. So if you find, if we find that instead of breaking the red bond that we're interested in, what happens is that you start breaking all other connections. So sometimes you're breaking at this position, sometimes at this position, sometimes at this position. All of those bond breaking events are using up hydrogen. And so what we found is that in some cases we would run out of hydrogen before the connection that we are interested in was actually broken. And the result of that is that if you compare to the very high conversions that I showed you in this slide before, in these molecules with this hydroxy methyl group here, um, what you find is that we found that the conversions were significantly low. And the reason for that is all our hydrogen was being used up on these unproductive um, disconnections without actually get, go, getting to the, uh, the connection that we are targeting. Now the question is, how do we solve this? Well, we cheated a little bit, just a bit, not too much. And what we did is that we fell back um, to using uh, a donor alcohol. I told you about these donor alcohols before. And the one we picked was isoprofenline. The reason why I picked this one is that the side product is acetone, and you know, that's, uh, I would say, the most desirable of side products that we could get from these donor alcohols. But what we find now is that when we add this extra source of hydrogen in the alcohol, that now the catalyst, it has its pickup of hydrogen donors. It can take hydrogen from the molecule itself, or when it run, runs out of hydrogen in the molecule, it can begin grabbing some from isoprofenone. And the result of that is that now what we get is almost exclusively um, products that result from breaking of the target carbon oxygen bond instead of all those other side products that we weren't interested in. And so if we take the same molecules again, before I showed you that the conversions were very low, but now if we add a little bit of isopropanol just to give it that extra boost in terms of the amount of available hydrogen, now we see that our conversions are recovering significantly and we can get very high conversions, even with these fairly complex lignin model compounds. But, um, you know, and, and in, the, in addition to that, um, if we add a little bit of an extra metal, in this case, um, nickel, then we can find that in almost all the model compounds, we get 100% um, conversion. Um, as opposed to 80 or 90%. So nickel does provide that extra boost in terms of um, cleavage of these lig uh, lignin model compounds. And one of the things that's really um, uh, very attractive about adding nickel is that it's very efficient at removing oxygen from the molecules. And that oxygen removal is going to be very important, especially for fuels, because you know fuels generally you don't want a whole lot of oxygen 
atoms in molecules that you're using for fuels and that you're going to be using for petrochemicals. So that's um, certainly important. But even more important than that is that with this extra, so this copper nickel catalyst you now, um, you make of, of, of two metals, in addition to getting very efficient conversions with the model compounds, we can now switch the actual lignin samples. So this is no longer models we make in the lab. This is raw lignin that we extract from um, aspen trees. And in this case, um, subjecting it to our copper nickel catalyst, we raise the temperature slightly to 200 degrees in this case. But uh, the important point here is that we can take raw lignin and using this copper catalyst, we can extract um, the small molecules that we are desire, desirous of um, from lignin without the addition of any external source of hydrogen. All right, so that's the first part of this talk, just looking at how we can circumvent the need for adding hydrogen for these critical hydrogenolysis reaction, reactions. I'm going to pause here for a couple of moments um, just to take some questions. And then we're going to switch gears to look at some other strategies that, um, that we can employ. I feel bad pausing us. I just want to keep going. I want to learn more, but we do have some questions. So it's good to take a, a brief break. Uh, for everyone in the audience, feel free to share your questions in the chat and I will moderate those or pop your hand up. Uh, the first one we have is related to all of those molecules that you are describing. I think there was seven that are produced out of that lignin that you talked about at the end, right. uh, four major products, and then three much smaller ones. Right. Are all of those molecules useful? Or are you looking for only an individual one? Well, no, actually, all those molecules do have potential to be useful. Um, you know, you think about, uh, you think about, for example, in the sense of fuels, I mean, the fuel you put, you put into your car, it's not one individual molecule, it's a mixture of, you know, I mean, some, in some cases, hundreds of different molecules. The important thing that you're looking for in terms of is the number of carbons and, you know, I mean, the connections that are there. And so the connections are more or less the same and the number of carbons are more or less the same. And so, you know, in terms of you're thinking about a fuel mix or even a petrochemical mix, um, this is something that could be used directly with some, with some removal of some of these oxygen groups. But yes, all these molecules have the potential to be, um, to be, to be useful. Love a no waste process. It's much better. Yeah. Uh, another question we had, and I think you mentioned this early on in the talk, but someone was wondering if you can just provide the estimate of how much CO2 is produced per kilogram of gasoline produced in Canada. I know you talked early on about how much carbon dioxide is released when we burn right. gasoline. Right. Um, so in, in terms of, of production in Canada, um, in general, so in general, uh, gasoline, in terms of producing, say, you know, per, a unit of gasoline, the production carbon dioxide is equivalent to about 30% of the combustion value. So, you know, if you're producing, say, three kilograms, you know, per liter, um, just ballparking, then um, on the production side, then maybe you're looking at about a kilogram. Um, and so while it's, it's, it's less than the production, it's less than the combustion side, but any, any place that we can find to reduce the carbon dioxide impact in the process is certainly an advance and desirable. Absolutely. I think one of Fez's comments I made early on is that we're trying to improve our current energy challenges. So this is one of those ways to really reduce our carbon dioxide emissions for something that we still currently need. Uh, next question we have is, what about using an acid catalyst such as ion exchange resins that have hydrogen ions for breaking the lignin molecules? Absolutely, that's something that actually is in the literature. It's not um, the focus of our own research, but um, definitely that's something that uh, um, you know is, 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 is practiced and there's a lot of um, research outside of our own um, Fez community here that focuses on that. Wonderful. Uh, next question, so they're just flying in. So if you see me looking this way, it's just because they're coming in the chat. Uh, is the internal hydro, the lysis process, uh, right. been demonstrated at the pilot scale? We're still at bench scale. Uh, okay. 
you know, we, you know, there's still things to be optimized. I and mean, if you look at, for example, the conversions that um, that um, I was showing here, I mean, we're total is we're approaching 10% conversion, but we'd have to go much higher before we go from bench scale to pilot scale reaction. You know what that timeline is? Uh, you know, it, it is hard to say. Um, you, uh, you know, we'd have to get engineers involved. I mean, I could be very optimistic to say five to 10 years. Um, but again, I think that, you know, you know, engineers, I think, are a much better place to um, chime in on um, something like that. There's always so many questions to add to that. Uh, the next question that we have is, have you looked at other distributions of the copper catalyst, things like nanotubes, different sizes, something other than what you're currently using? Um, uh, so, I mean, nanotubes, um, different shape distributions we haven't, but we have looked at bigger sizes. So we looked at variety of methods for making the copper catalyst. And what we found is that the method we use gave us the smallest um, possible sizes. Um, but also very stable particles, because what happens usually, you know, when you have particles that small, is that when you put them on the reaction conditions, they tend to all just bunch up together. And then once they're bunched up together, they're not as active because you don't have as much exposure um, if they're all, um, you know, crowded together. So we found that these really small particles that we prepared by a, a method that we call surface organometallic chemistry, were the most active. The other particles we use were were bigger and generally less active for the process. They work, but just weren't as active as, as these particular ones. You're really finding that something with that high surface area, that small particle to be the most active. Wonderful. Uh, the next question is, how does the added isopropyl alcohol impact the carbon footprint of this process? That, that's a very good question. I mean, you remember that I mentioned that um, that you know, adding IPA is a bit is cheating a bit, and ideally, um, we do uh, you know any additive at all is going to increase the carbon impact of um, your process, right? Um, and um, there's the fact that you have a side product now that you're going to have to dispose of or find a use for. I mean, fortunately, I, acetone that we get from you know um, as a byproduct of IPA is a fairly useful um, side product. It's used a lot as a solvent in, in, in industry but um, we're aware that you know adding IP does um, push up the, 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 the carbon impact and we certainly are working at moving away from these added alcohols to a lignin only um, as both the source of the molecules and the source of hydrogen for the process but yes that's a very very good um, observation. We have some amazing questions here tonight. Right. Uh, I guess the next question is related to that lignin. And I think this will be our last one for now. And then we'll jump back into questions at the end. Uh, the last question is about this lignin material. Do you get a straight a container of lignin and that's what you use? Or are you getting raw plant material and you have to extract the lignin from that and remove all of those other value products that you talked about earlier? Where, where is our lignin coming from? Precisely what we want to do. So essentially what we do is that we take sawdust um, and we extract lignin by a chemical process and use that lignin. But ideally where we want to go is that, you know, the paper and pulp industry, they're masters at separating lignin for cellulose because they need the cellulose for paper. And, you know, now they're using higher value, you know, creating higher value materials from cellulose. So essentially what we want to do is get to a point where we can take waste lignin from the paper and pulp industry and use that directly. But for now, you know, in terms of our bench scale processes, we are extracting um, our own lignin from um, sawdust. It's a great place to start, but it's really cool to see where you could have large scale partnerships for future work with those industries. Okay. Amazing. Well, I'm going to pass it back to you. There are many more questions, so we'll we'll address those at the end. Uh, but we'll get back into the second half. All right, no problem. All right, I'll try to um, go through as quickly so we have lots of time for questions. Sounds good. Okay, so this is where I left you. So we're going to change gears a bit and um, go back to this idea of hydrogen, right? And um, another thing about hydrogen, if, you, if anybody remembers their high school chemistry, is that hydrogen really 
is uh, two protons and two electrons, right? And the two electrons are attached to each other in a bond. And I've drawn, drawn it here. So you have the two hydrogen atoms and there's this um, connection between them. That's two electrons. So if you break hydrogen down, what you're looking at is two hydrogen atoms, positively charged, we call them protons, and two electrons that were in the bond. And then if you know a little bit of, if you go back to your high school physics, you know that electrons, really, if you move them around, then you get electricity. So essentially, we can view hydrogen, you know, moving hydrogen as moving two protons and moving two electrons, which is analogous to electricity. So the question then is, well, can we use electricity as a substitute for hydrogen in the hydrogenolysis process, right? So that's a different vein of research that we were chasing. Then. So essentially what we want to do is to go back to these lignin uh, uh, model compounds, but instead of you know, heating the reactions um, and, 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 and um, to get the, the carbon oxygen bond cleavage, we want to essentially use electricity to grab hydrogen atom, whether from the molecule or from a donor solvent, and to move the, use the electrons and protons to effect cleavage of the bonds. And um, we were able to do this. Now you notice I've just put, you know, I mean, this um, electric, you know, this um, uh, lightning symbol here, because there are still things that are, you know, we're not ready to uh, you know, reveal publicly, especially, you know, on a platform like this, but suffice it to say that we're developing methods now that are very, very encouraging. So what we find is that using, um, you know, under electrochemical conditions in an electrochemical cell, we take our lignin molecule at room temperature. And um, when we apply a voltage, um, the result is that we are now able to cleave, not necessarily at the carbon oxygen bond that we were focused on earlier, but now we're able to cleave at a variety of different um, positions. And if we modulate the electrochemical conditions, depending on the additives that we're using, then we're getting disconnections at various um, positions. In this case, we're disconnecting primarily at this position, while in um, the bottom reaction, we're disconnecting primarily at the carbon-oxygen bond. Let me just get my, my laser pointer here. Um, so um, we're pretty excited about that. And not just uh, model compounds, but again, if we take our raw lignin samples and subject it to these electrochemical conditions, we extract a chemical that's called vanillin. That should make you think about vanilla. Um, you know, so we're extracting this natural product um, from lignin under electrochemical conditions. And we're still optimizing the process to ensure that we're getting the full spectrum of molecules, not just um, not just vanillin, right? So that's it for lignin and electrochemistry. And we're very happy about this, this is electrochemical depolymerization of lignin at room temperature, right? No heating is applied. Um, and, you know, if our source of electricity is renewable, then, you know, I mean, um, we think that we could be laughing all the way to the bank in terms of um, at least the, the greenhouse gas bank anyways, um, because this would be a very, very low impact um, process, right? But now I want to switch back um, to look at a, a more traditional side, um, you know, of, 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 of the fuel equation. And that is the, 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 um, the, 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 the um, fossil fuel side of things, because, the vast majority of our current energy and petrochemical mix comes from fossil fuels. So if we can focus on making this process more efficient, both in terms of um, you know, bringing temperatures down and reducing hydrogen consumption, then we can reduce the greenhouse gas impact of the process. The combustion is still going to be there and that's going to be addressed you know, with battery electric vehicles and more fuel efficient vehicles but at least the process side, we can reduce the impact. Okay, so just a little bit of a treatise on um, you know, um, fossil fuels. Essentially, we have these fossil fuels in the ground and you know, in the Alberta context, it's generally oil sands. And we need to get these fossil fuels from the ground, we need to deliver them to refineries or um, whether here in Alberta or you know, across Canada or in the United States or um, other places. The challenge with Alberta oil sands is that we can't just take, you know, oil from the ground 
put it in a pipeline and send it to Edmonton, Vancouver, or, or Texas. Uh, what has to be done because of the nature of um, the product that we have here in Alberta, that we have to do one of two things. Because it's so viscous, we either have to dilute it. So we add a solvent to make it less viscous so it can flow in a pipeline. The challenge though, is that you know the more sol solvent you add is the more expensive the process becomes, right? So, and then you hear about this bitumen discount or oil is always discounted because of this dilution problem. There's another thing that you can do is that you can take the material at places like say um, Fort McMurray or you know uh, say Scotford here in Edmonton, and you can do what's called upgrading, where you take the raw food and you know there's quite a bit of heating involved and some hydrogen and other processes, and you convert the material from the raw food to what's called synthetic. Crude. And if anybody you know about syn crude, it's essentially just uh, it means synthetic crude, right? The challenge with the syn crude is that because of all the heating and hydrogen that's involved in the process, now the amount of greenhouse gases associated with the processing is going to be rising. And if you think about in terms of the capital expenditure to build out these upgraders and to operate them, it's going to add quite a bit of cost. And that's why, you know, I mean, again, our oil generally sells at a discount and we can't fetch as much as say Saudi Arabia would for their um, raw crude oil. So, you know, one of the challenges that we wanted to, to take on was to say, can we do some limited amount of processing on raw crude to get it into the pipeline without adding all these costs and greenhouse gases just to get the crude to a point where it can be pumped in a pipeline. That is before it even gets to uh, refining, right? And that's our challenge, processing bitumen without dilution and without you know, uh, the high cost of upgrading, right? Now, one of the reasons why bitumen is so challenging a part of Alberta crude is that um, what we have is a very, um, highly aggregated product, especially one fraction of bitumen that's called asphaltines, right? And you know, asphaltines essentially is, uh, this is just a cartoon representation of them. But essentially, it's a complex mismatch of molecules. And these molecules have all these interactions with each other. So, you know, I mean, the green interactions, they're stacked on top of each other. In some cases, you know, one atom binds to another atom. But the overall effect is that the asphaltine section of bitumen, and there's quite a bit of asphaltines in Alberta oil sands, makes our bitumen very highly aggregated. And as a result, it's pretty dense and it's very viscous. So if you look at this graph here at the bottom um, right hand corner, this is our Alberta bitumen here. And this is just a graph looking at um, the viscosity, you know what I mean, of the bitumen and how to process it to get it to pipeline conditions. So Alberta bitumen starts off with an API gravity, which is just a measure of density and viscosity combined. That's very low, 7.8. Now, if the API number is low, it means you have a very dense, very, very viscous and dense product, right? To get it in a pipeline, the API has to be at least 18 or 19. So you can see that you can't take Athabasca bitumen and put it in a pipeline. You actually have to process it even before it sees a pipeline or you have to dilute it. Now there are a number of ways to go about processing this bitumen to get it to a pipeline. But the best thing to do, if you look at this, um, you know, this square point here and look at the key, is that you add hydrogen and remove sulfur and nitrogen. But once you hear hydrogen, alarm bell should be going off. Is that if we need to put hydrogen in the oil if just to get it into the pipeline, then that's going to be adding cost and that's going to be adding greenhouse gases. And this is one of the reasons, not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons why Alberta Oil Sands has this record of being so carbon intensive because of the pre-processing that needs to be done just to get the product. To market. So if we can find a way around this where we can still um, you know, upgrade the product to get it to market, but without all this greenhouse gas intensive process, we would be on to something, right? 
Um, no, there are ways to do it. And we looked at, you know, just the thermal process of using just hydrogen and low temperatures and uh, along with a catalyst and some promoters. And we're able to take this test compound and, you know, we could add hydrogen and remove sulfur. And um, that was effective. But again, you know, we have the challenge of hydrogen. And so while it's an advantage because it's a very low temperature compared to say four or 500 degrees that's used in industry, but we really want to address this hydrogen elephant in the room. It's a small molecule, but a big elephant. Luckily, this electrochemical strategy that we found works so well for bitumen is actually very transferable to petroleum um, sources. So let's take this compound, right? It's called dibenzothiophene. And it's a very good model for, you know, these heavy, um, you know, dense aggregates that are found naturally in oil. So what we want to do is that we want to create a process that remember two things that we want to add hydrogen and we want to remove sulfur. Well, we found that again, under electrochemical conditions, if you tune your process just right, we can actually take this molecule and add a fair amount of hydrogen to it. Um, you know, these are just showing just some of the molecules that we're able to get out. So we started with this molecule that had you know, um, 10 hydrogen atoms. You go over here, you see that now we're adding quite a bit more hydrogen atoms. So we're doing a process that's called saturating the molecule without um, hydrogen gas. And in addition to that, if we tweak our process a little bit again, um, so remember here we're exclusively adding hydrogen, but if we tweak our process in this case, we can both add hydrogen and we can remove sulfur. And remember that graph I showed you that that is the target process for getting the bitumen to pipeline capacity. You want to add hydrogen and remove sulfur. So these are laboratory scale molecules. One of the things that we're really excited about is that we can take asphaltine sources. Now, asphaltines, as I mentioned before, this is the worst of the worst in terms of fraction of bitumen that's most problematic. You know, it's not very soluble. So if you add these diluents to it and put it in a pipeline, then the asphaltines have a tendency to precipitate out and they can clog the pipeline and other equipment. Um, you know, so, so what we did is that we went after this most problematic um, fragment of, 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 of bitumen. And we found that under electrochemical conditions, we could convert this material that's not very soluble in hexane, and hexane solubility is like the gold standard in terms of the quality of the product. So we can take this um, very insoluble, difficult to work with uh, fraction of bitumen, and under electrochemical processing conditions, we can convert that into material that is more resembling the kind of crude that we can pump through a pipeline. And uh, we're repeating this not just with asphaltines, but with whole bitumen samples in terms of converting more of the asphaltines into the kind of material that is going to be a better quality crude, easier to pump um, through pipelines, right? And so we're excited about this. This essentially represents electrochemical disaggregation of heavy oil, but we're doing this instead of at four or 500 degrees with um, hydrogen gas being added, we're doing this at much milder conditions. We're doing it um, without um, you know, added hydrogen. Yes, we do have um, some hydrogen donors, um, but uh, we're really very excited about this and that we're um, continuing to de develop this. And lest you should think that you know, this um, is just a pipe dream, you know, this idea of electrification of oil processing. This is something that is actually an imminent um, you know, reality. So I took this from just two weeks ago. You know, Shell announced that the Scottford refinery, the same refinery I told you about with that carbon capture and storage, what they're going to be doing is that they're going to be installing what they say is the largest um, solar panel installation at their pipeline. And uh, what they want to do is that they want to supply as much as 20% of their refinery's energy needs with renewable electricity. Now, they might be thinking about energy needs just in terms of heat and so forth. But what we're showing here is that we're developing a process where instead of just using electricity for heat to run a refinery, we can actually use electricity to do the refining or to do the upgrading. And if it's a renewable source of electricity, then again, 
we are really, um, you know, raking it in, in terms of the benefits of reducing the greenhouse gas impact of the overall process. So um, that's more or less it. So what I hope I've showed you um, today is that uh, this um, uh, concept of hydrogenolysis without added hydrogen is actually possible. We can do it under thermal conditions with a copper catalyst in the case of lignin, um, or we can use electrochemical conditions to break lignin apart or to add hydrogen and remove sulfur from oil compounds. And this is not just limited to model compounds or we're taking actual raw feeds, whether it be um, lignin that we've extracted from plant material or bitch, um, asphalt teams and raw bitumen that we get um, you know, from the oil sands, but under whether thermal or electrochemical conditions, we're beginning to see the depolymerization in case of lignin and disaggregation in, 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 in the case of oil. That's um, certainly very encouraging in terms of how we can move this, uh, whether electro electrochemical upgrading or electrochemical processing or this um, sort of um, hydrogen free processing in terms of thermal process for lignin. Um, but we're very encouraged on this and we are working on fairly assiduously to optimize this to get uh, much better results, of course. And as uh, somebody asked before, what we want eventually is to move from the bench scale um, to um, the pilot scale. Um, and so we're working assiduously on improving these processes. Um, so that they're ready for uh, sort of, you know, piloting um, in terms of processes. So with that, I'd just like to thank you all very much for um, joining me. I've gone on for quite a bit, um, but just allow me to thank a wonderful research team that's driving this process. Um, myself, Professor Stryker, and, um, you know, um, Dr. Hamilton, Scott, Jadav, and um, our PhD candidate, Amir. Um, we're, together, we're driving this project forward as fast as we can or as efficiently as we can. And finally, I'd just like to thank you all for listening. Thank you to EPL for hosting this wonderful series. And that's the end of it. I'm happy to take any questions um, that are still lingering. Well, that was wonderful. You can only see me and Cassidy, but huge round of applause. That was such an interesting talk. That hour just flew by. I know that everyone in the audience has learned so much questions were just flying in uh and i know we're gonna see that uh, in this section so pop your questions in the chat we are excited to see them it's just such a interesting process and it seems like there's real value and ways we can take it forward so the first question that we have is talking about those asphaltines how are they currently dealt with because it is such a current challenge um are they useful at all? How do we deal with them at this point until we've brought in this new method? Uh, there, there are a number of ways. Um, so there is, uh, in, in some situations, there is a process that's called de-asphalting, which is essentially removing the asphalt teams from oil and then we keep the rest of the product and send that to refiners. Um, and that's a viable process. The only challenge is that because Alberta bitumen has a much higher asphaltine content than most um, bitumen around the world, what you find is that if we have to go through a significant amount of de-asphalting, then we're losing quite a bit of uh, volume in terms of our product. So if you have to reject, say, 20 or so percent of your material that you pump out of the ground, you reject that, and then you have to find something to do with that rejected material, then you know that adds cost and it just really you know uh, you know uh, makes your process less viable it's still profitable but less viable than say um you know you get from say saudi crude which is like the um the gold standard of crude um there's another process that's called coking and it's essentially a carbon rejection process where you heat you know to high temperatures and the asphalt teams especially they tend to uh, you know rapidly kind of convert they lose hydrogen and convert to this um, very intractable material that's called coke and in that case i mean you can just bury that or burn it and this i mean fortunately for, for us um no another um you know section of our group um is really looking keenly at how we can actually take this coke this rejected um asphaltine 
um, you know, fraction and actually add value to that so we can convert it into valuable material. But yes, the in short answer is that there are processes for removing the asphalt teams now and actually it's favored in some cases. Um, and, uh, but we want to move away from that obviously. Absolutely. And when you're talking about that hydrogenolysis um, with uh, copper, uh, the copper catalyst, the electro uh, electrocatalyst, you talked about the electrocatalyst being used for both the biomass and the um, the crude oil and with the copper catalyst being used for the lignin. Can the copper catalyst also be flipped to the uh, being used oh. in crude oil? Uh the copper by itself, no, but copper and nickel together, definitely. Because I mean, I don't know if you remember that. I mean, the the the, the process that we developed for using hydrogen to process um, crude oil with um, potassium um, as an additive that relies on nickel, and um, essentially, and we found that you know for 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 lignin processing, we put copper and nickel together. You know, copper works well for harvesting the hydrogen, nickel works well for breaking the bonds. So it is envision we envision that you know, it is possible, and we haven't um, done the, the bench scale test yet, but it's possible to have sort of co-processing where you can use lignin as essentially your source of hydrogen, raw hydrogen for processing, um, you know, crude oil. And this kind of co-processing is something that has been talked about in, um, in the industry. I mean, I don't know that there's any demonstration of it yet, but it's been talked about and that kind of crossover is certainly very attractive. Wonderful, thank you for addressing that. Uh, many more questions. Uh, next one, are there research objectives to further fine tune the electrochemical hydrogenation process to target only the hydrogen in the raw bitumen to produce hydrogen in situ and leave out the undesirable carbon residue? Uh, you know, if I understand what you're um, or you're saying, well, is that uh, we we want to use the electrochemical process certainly to harvest hydrogen from bitumen. So instead of say adding a hydrogen donor, because there are molecules in bitumen that can produce hydrogen. In fact, um, you know, when you heat coking reactions, essentially, you know, you get um, in some cases coke which is carbon enriched fraction. And then the other fraction is hydrogen enriched. So we can definitely uh, harvest hydrogen from um, you know, some fractions in bitumen and use that for processing. And we definitely want to go there. I hope I understood what you're asking um, correctly. That that's definitely where we want to go. And I will admit that, I mean, currently, um, as on the bitumen side of things, we're not ready for pilot scale. There are still things in terms of additives that we need to reduce to make the process viable because you know you don't want to go to industry with a process that has you know three or four additives um, because that's going to add cost and you're going to need to um, deal with waste and so forth. Um, so we want to be able to just stick electrodes directly in bitumen without additives and harvest hydrogen from one place and use it to to break the bonds and, and, and do the disaggregation that we're targeting. Wonderful. Uh, Paul, if you had anything you wanted to clarify on that, feel free to jump back in the chat and I'm happy to pass those messages along. Uh, next question is how much power are we talking about to have efficient electrocatalysis uh, and would it scale to industrial production or is it always gonna be more on the small scale? Well, uh, so there are two things here. One is that, I mean, we envisage that this is going to be done in one of two ways. Um, first, the most ideal is that um, with renewable electricity. And you know, if you're dealing with renewable electricity, you know, wind or, or solar sources, then you're less concerned about um, the amount of electricity you're drawing because you know, it's renewable, there's no greenhouse gases associated with it. That being said, um, uh, we, we do try to, you know, work at low voltages, but we do currently supply ex more electrons than we need to make the process work. And we are working on trying to get to a point where sub we're supplying just enough electrons to make the process work, right? Um, we're not there yet, and we're definitely working towards it. And that's a very, very good question, because, you know, if we bring this up with industry, that's the first question they're asking. 
really how much power does this take? And I mean, is the amount of electricity you need just equal to the amount of heat that would be get from, you know, say burning methane to drive the process? And we're targeting, um, I mean, we're operating at fairly low voltages as is, but we definitely are, are, are moving towards um, trying to develop a much more efficient process than we currently have. Um, and to address that very, um, to address that very concern. I think we're gonna have to invite your lab back in like a year or two and find out how things have oh, changed. It feels like things are moving pretty quickly and we can see some, some major breakthroughs in the next little while. Okay. Uh, and people in the audience are saying, please do come back. So okay. right. wonderful. Uh, again, anyone, if you have any last questions, pop them in the chat. Uh, the next question we have is from earlier on in your talk. Um, you are addressing the processing kind of right. side and not the burning of the fossil fuels or the biomass. Mm -hmm. When we think about greenhouse gases emitted from energy, does more come from the processing side than the actual burning side? Are they pretty even? Um, is this going to make a big difference? No. Um, and, uh, you know, I mentioned if you take, for example, gasoline um, alone, um, you look at the fact that, the, you know, the process side, I mean, the greenhouse gases on the process side is about 30% at best, or sometimes even less, you know, 20 to 30% of what they are on the combustion side. But, you know, here's the reality that we're existing in, and you hinted at this earlier, is that as much as we are intensifying our transition, to renewables um, on the transportation fuel side of things. Um, you know, battery electric vehicles just this year accounted for less than 1% of sales, total sales, right? And now that's going to accelerate, but it's going to mean that all vehicles that are sold this year and the next year, and the ones that like my own car that's about 10 or so years old that I plan to keep for maybe another 10 years, you know, what I'm saying is that um, we're not going to see overnight the disappearance of, um, you know, burning of fossil fuels, right? And so I think at least we have a very, um, we have a responsibility now to address those um, parts of the equation that we can address um, to reduce the carbon intensity of the overall process. I do think eventually we're going to get to the point where um, phase out, you know, the internal combustion engine. And in that point, then we address completely the, the combustion side of things. Um, but petrochemicals, we're going to still need, you know, so while we might go to say battery electric vehicles, but you know, all the plastics that we use and plastics to make the vehicles, you know, all of that comes currently from petrochemicals. And so um, we're still going to have to do quite a bit of processing of the raw material to get our petrochemicals and so if we can you know address the, 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 the emissions on the processing side it's definitely going to have a long-term impact that lasts beyond phasing out of internal combustion vehicles absolutely it is uh it's not a flipping the switch it is a long-term process that's going to take a lot of steps along the way and this is an important one right, right. Uh, next question since the goal is to use the electrochemical process at an industrial scale, will there be a global GHG carbon calculation done uh, to assess what is needed? Uh, and that's from Amir. If... Uh, well, you know, um, I, you know, I hope I'm understanding the question correctly. And, and here's the thing that uh, if, the, 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 there's some carbon impact on, say, implementing renewable electricity. So, you know, making the solar panels, making the, um, the, the turbines for wind and so on. There's some carbon impact there. Um, you, you know, even constructing a hydroelectric dam, there's some carbon impact. The thing is that once we put these things in place, right, there's upfront, there's this very steep upfront carbon impact. But once we've put these renewable sources of fuel in place, then essentially they're carbon zero going forward, right? And so, you know, I think that once, if, you know, if a lot of this electrification is powered by um, renewable electricity, then we definitely, um, you know, the, the impact certainly is going to fall off over time, you know, except for the upfront um, investment. 
Um, even if we're using non-renewable electricity, the, the, the thing is that if we can make these processes um, efficient enough, we are working on it, we can make these processes efficient you know, so that the um, energy impact is less than current processes where we're using heat you know, or we're using or we're generating hydrogen by the traditional means. If we can at least switch to, you know, an, an electrified regime where, you know, the, the energy impact is less than current, um, then I, I think we're certainly, um, we're certainly, you know, going to be in the net positive in terms of carbon reduction. Um, so yes, those calculations are needed. And definitely, you know, I mean, on the, 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 the bench side of things, we have to make the process efficient enough so that when it goes to scale, it's actually making a difference, you know, when those calculations are done. And it's not just about, you know, juggling, car juggling carbon instead of heat, you know, you get carbon from heat, the carbon comes from electricity generation. We don't want to do that. We actually want to make an impact that leads to a reduction in um, um, carbon emissions. Absolutely. Um, and that is exactly the question that they were asking and the answer that they were seeking. So oh, well, perfect. Yeah. Amazing. Right. Uh, last question, gonna be a big one. Right. What can we do now as individuals, uh, those of us both working in energy and those of us just living in our world, do to make a difference in climate change from your perspective, your expertise? I know well, it's a big question. Oh, I mean, first of all, I'm no expert in climate change. I'll tell you that much. You know, I can tell you lots of old copper catalysis, but not a whole lot about climate change. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a website that, you know, I came across when I was doing a lot of this climate change reading that was called the 1.5 degree web um, lifestyle. And, you know, interesting thing that they highlighted was Canada, for example, actually is one of the worst um, in terms of per capita impact on, um, you know, in terms of carbon dioxide per capita um, that's emitted. Um, and the thing is that because, you know, we live in a place that's, um, you know, we have winter all the time. Um, so you have to heat your houses. Um, you we have to drive lots of places. I told you I like going out to Jasper. I don't know if I give up my Jasper trips to, um, to contribute to reducing climate change. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, the governments are, are, the government now, you know, they're trying to push investments that uh, they're expensive up front, you know, like say, for example, green hydrogen, they're trying to switch from, you know, um, from gray to green hydrogen that it adds cost up front, but you know, it's worth doing. I think we definitely have to sort of evaluate our lifestyles to say, well, you know, it might be um, fun to have, you know, massive um, SUV and, you know, I, 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 I am in, in the doghouse as far as that con concerned there, um, but maybe, you know, our buying choices. Um, you know, maybe we have to adjust things like our buying choices. Um, maybe we have to watch, you know, do we need, I mean, all this stuff that we buy off Amazon all the time that has to be shipped um, from all corners of the earth it has some climate impact. Eh? Um, so do we need all of that? Um, and then, you know, as you know, we're lots of young people are probably on here. We're looking at buying homes. Are we trying to buy homes that, you know, have some incorporation of solar panels or geothermal heating, things like that. Um, is things swirling around there about eating, you know, I mean, and, you know, I know I'm in Alberta, so I don't want to step on toes, but, you know, I just adjusting our diet, you know, eating more, um, you know, fruits and vegetables, which is really healthy for you, has a lot of impact. So there's a lot of things that, you know, can be done. But again, let me just, um, you know, bookend that by saying or reiterating that I'm no climate expert, really. And, uh, you know, I see you put in the chat some things there that proper experts have um, put together as to how you can make um, an impact on this um, that's happening. But it's one thing that we ought to take it seriously because it is happening and it's affecting um, people around us. And um, just this last summer teaches us, you know, the heat of the last summer teaches us that as much as we're in a cool place, you know, we're not immune for, from the effects of a um, change in climate. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing thoughts on that very big question. 
uh, and for sharing your research. Uh, I know that this, I learned so much uh, from this talk and I am sure our audience did as well. There have been so many glowing responses in the chat. Uh, thank you, Tracy, and everyone else who said, who shared your thoughts on this, uh, this evening. Right. Rain, thank you again. Huge round of applause. It was my pleasure. We've loved having you. Everyone, we hope to see you at our next EPL talk in January. So we won't be around in December, but we're back in January. The link is in the chat for you to sign up. We also have the link to learn more about Arrain's research. Uh, and if you can let us know what you thought of tonight's talk, there is a question air. Uh, let's us know what you're looking for in the future so that we can try and find it. You can sign up for the newsletter in there, everything to learn more. Thank you all again, Cassidy, any last remarks from you? All I can echo is thank you. That was a really fantastic, engaging talk. Um, I want to echo what Tracy said is that Doreen, you do a fantastic job of making the science really accessible for someone who is not a chemist and struggled a little bit in high school chemistry. So thank you for that. Um, and for all the folks joining us, thank you again for, for coming out this evening. I will be sending you one last email tomorrow morning. So if you missed a link, I uh, expect an email in your inbox uh, first thing tomorrow with all of that information. And thanks, right. everyone. Yes, thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and we will see you next month. <laughs>